For the final session of the Reinventing Destiny Conference, we have a dialogue with our guest of honour, Mr Lawrence Wong. He is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. DPM Wong is also the Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, and a member of the Future Economy Council, the Research, Innovation and Enterprise Council, and the National Research Foundation Board. He sits on the board of GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Wealth Fund, and chairs its Investment Strategies Committee. The dialogue will be moderated by Dr. Farid Zakaria, host of Farid Zakaria GPS on CNN, a weekly international and domestic affairs program that airs around the world on CNN. Since its debut in 2008, this program has featured interviews with global figures such as Barack Obama, Narendra Modi, Bill Gates and the Dalai Lama, among others. The show won the prestigious Peabody Award in 2011. Mr. Zakaria, please. Thank you so much. It is a great pleasure and honor to be back in Singapore, particularly on uh, the year that marks Lee Kuan Yew's uh, centenary. Uh, it, I, I remember very fondly my first meeting with him many, many years ago. I think it's almost 25 uh, years ago or more. Uh, and it is fitting that we should mark that occasion without much discussion of him, but rather the legacy that he left, which is this extraordinary city-state. So. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I thank NUS and, uh, and all the organizers. Uh, we are also particularly honored to have Lawrence Wong uh, here. Uh, let me outline for you very simply what the, uh, the format will be, and then we will get right to the substance. The Deputy Prime Minister will make a few opening remarks. He and I will then engage in a conversation uh, for a while, and then we will take questions from the public. Uh, from not the public, but uh, from, from everyone gathered here. I have only one request, which is the discussion between the Deputy Prime Minister and myself is being recorded to be used on my CNN program. So uh, one, I, I will beg your indulgence. I might ask him a question that he's also already answered in his uh, opening remarks. And so he may some, I may be asking him to repeat himself. My other in, indulgence to ask is, uh, please don't do anything w ex extremely noisy. No loud booing or, or, or hysterical <laughs> cheers of applause. I suspect this is not something one needs to say in Singapore anyway. But, <laughs> I hope uh, I don't say anything. Well. <laughs> but, but I just thought I would let you all know. Um, in any event, uh, without further ado, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, Lawrence Wong. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thanks. Is this on? Right. Thanks very much, Farid. I hope I don't say anything that will elicit loud booing. <laughs> Applause will be welcome, though. But uh, let me start by saying I'm very happy to join all of you for this conference to mark the centenary of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's birth. Uh, since independence, uh, Singapore has defied the odds of history, and we have charted our own destiny. When we started out, the journey was very daunting. And we had many problems to overcome. But our founding leaders under Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, as well as our pioneers, dealt with the challenges head on and helped to build the thriving metropolis that we have today. Of course, now when we look ahead, there are new challenges, lots of uncertainties around us. We look at a world that is topsy-turvy, full of geopolitical tensions, economic fragmentation, technological disruptions. And there are many things to deal with, but I'd like to highlight three broad shifts that we have to worry about. First, the global multilateral trading system is under siege and will be shifting, will evolve. The last few decades saw a remarkable consensus around free trade and win-win economic cooperation. Countries didn't have to be friends to do business with one another. In fact, we encouraged and promoted interdependence for greater stability. And now that consensus is over, it's not quite clear what will take its place, but we are seeing the outlines of a new paradigm emerging, certainly in the US and the G7. It's a paradigm with more active state involvement in markets, 
understandably, from the Western developed world point of view, they would like to rebuild their industrial bases, reduce exposure to geopolitical rivals, and ultimately shore up security. And this will have huge implications for all of us. Second, and a related point, is uh, I don't think in the foreseeable future we will see deglobalization happening. In fact, if you look at overall trade flows, they have remained healthy above pre-COVID levels. But we will see a different pattern of globalization. Shifts in the way trade and investments are made, not so much shaped by economic logic anymore, but much more by geopolitical alignment and security. We already see the bifurcation in high-end semiconductor chips, and I'm sure that bifurcation will expand to new areas, particularly contested areas of technology like quantum computing or artificial intelligence. And we hope it won't go, won't go beyond that, but even a selective bifurcation into two technological spheres will have tremendous impact and profound implications for the entire economy. Uh, thirdly, how all of this unfolds ultimately will depend on the US-China relationship. There has already been a big shift in the nature of the relationship because for a long time the US talked about strategic engagement and getting China to be a responsible stakeholder in the global system. But there is now a growing sense in America that that approach has failed, that China's rise threatens America's interests and values. And so we have shifted from strategic engagement to strategic competition. To be clear, neither side wants an outright confrontation, nor neither side wants to go to war, but intense, or if not extreme, competition will be the defining feature in the bilateral relationship. Uh, we hope there will be guardrails to manage that competition, but we have to be prepared for unpredictable or even dangerous outcomes emerging. And we all know that there are hotspots in the region, including in the Taiwan Straits and South China Sea, where accidents and miscalculations can happen. So these are the major changes around us that we have to be prepared for. We wish none of this were happening, because all of these big changes really mean that we will be operating in an external environment that will be less benign and less hospitable for small states like Singapore. But we have to take the world as it is, not as we would like it to be. So we will just have to adapt and learn to navigate in this new environment. At the same time, I think we should take heart that there are silver linings even in the darkest of clouds. Uh, and so even in this new environment, there will be new, there, there will be new opportunities for small countries like us. Uh, and, and in fact, if you look at the Singapore story, it's always been about turning every challenge into opportunity, converting every vulnerability into strength. And we are starting off in a far stronger position today. We have more resources. We are better equipped to deal with our vulnerabilities. We have a good system in place to adapt and adjust and put in place effective long-term policies. And we have a solid reputation as a reliable and trusted hub for the region and the world. So we can build on all of these competitive strengths to move forward. In the end, our ability to reinvent destiny, as it were, depends not just on the government, but on all of us in Singapore. Because Singapore will always be an improbable and unlikely nation forged out of the collective will of our people. So if we keep faith with each other, we will be able to chart our way forward in this uncertain world and continue to write many more chapters of the Singapore story. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. That was a, a very cogent and uh, intelligent uh, summary of the kind of challenges you're facing. Uh, particularly impressive that you gave it without any prepared remarks or notes in your, uh, in your hand. Um, when Lee Kuan Yew would talk to me about what he was most proud about, about Singapore, he often said that um, people focused on the great economic success. And that to him, that, that in a sense forgot something that was even more impressive, which was the building of a nation, 
out of a polyglot community of Chinese, Malay, Indians on this sandbar uh, at the edge of Malaysia when, when, uh, when, they were, when, when he was expelled, when, when Singapore was expelled from it. Around the world, a lot of places we are seeing a return to a kind of tribalism, a return to a, cer a certain kind of ethnic, eth you know, ethnic or communal uh, solidarity and feelings, which is causing tensions in various places, in the West and in the East. Do you feel like that is a problem that Singapore has to deal with, or have you dealt with have you dealt with that problem well enough that you don't see those, those dangers or those tensions? It will be a continuing challenge. Uh, you rightly said that it is quite remarkable that in our short 58 years of independence, we have built a strong sense of solidarity and trust as one people. Uh, it's a work in progress. I would say we have, never, we have not arrived but we have come a long way. Quite remarkable for su such a short period of time. Uh, we started on this basis that to become a Singaporean, you do not have to give up your ethnic identity. You can be Chinese, Malay, Indian, Eurasian, whatever backgrounds, but when you become a Singaporean, you add to your traditions, your cultures. So we try very hard to create a society where every ethnic group, no matter how small you are, will always have a place. We, we encourage them to, every group, to maintain, to retain our, their traditions, retain their cultures, and celebrate those. But at the same time, we enlarge the common space we have as Singaporeans. We build that common sense of being Singaporean together. And in the last 58 years, that sense of being Singaporean has grown and strengthened. But it is a work in progress. It will never, uh, the, the, the forces of tribalism will never go away. They are always at the background. It's a bit like COVID-19. The virus doesn't go away. Like now, it's endemic. And these ugly forces, the ugly dark forces of racialism and tribalism are always there at the background. We have to understand that, keep that in mind, but at the same time work very hard to strengthen our bonds as, as Singaporeans, which we will continue to do. And that, that strong sense of solidarity and trust is what got us through the last three years of COVID-19 and enabled us to emerge stronger. You know, with the, with the polyglot population, uh, like say the United States, Singapore has a slightly different approach, it seems to me. Uh, you don't Quite emphasize different. as much the melting pot. We are, we are not a melting pot. Right. You talk about a kind of live and let live and each culture being its own. It's about multiracialism and multiculturalism. That means it's not assimilation. It's not a melting pot either. Everyone retains your own sense of identity. You, it's important that everyone knows their roots, uh, their traditions, their cultures. But on top of that, we layer on top of that that common sense of being Singaporean. And so today, if you are a Chinese Singaporean, yes, you can have your roots linked back to China. You are Malay Singaporean, you are Indian Singaporean. Your, our ancestral roots go back to different civilizations around us. But the Chinese Singaporean is different from the Chinese in China. The Malay Singaporean is different from the Malay in the Malay archipelago. And the Indian Singaporean is quite different from the Indian in India. There is something distinctive and unique about being Singaporean, which we have been able to build within this short period of time. And I'm sure that sense of being Singaporean, that distinctive sense of being Singaporean, will continue to strengthen over time. You have a number of things that help forge that common bond. You have public housing that 80% of the population participates in, and the, the, the housing blocks are uh, um, are, are meant to reflect the racial composition of the country. Uh, you have a national service, a military service. Will it be possible to continue those kinds of uh, bonding mechanisms as you get more and more people coming from all over the world attracted by, the, the Sing by Singapore's success? Not just possible, it is essential, even existential because we cannot afford to be a country divided by race, religion, or by different tribes. 
we must continue to build unity out of diversity. And so it's credit to our founding leaders like Mr. Lee Kuan Yew that put in place very intrusive policies which required every housing estate, public housing estate, to represent the ethnic proportions of Singapore and every block to have that representation. It was difficult when these policies were first introduced, but over time we have seen the benefits of it. We do not have ethnic enclaves. Everywhere you go in Singapore, different housing estates, children grow up together, different backgrounds. They go to the same schools, they go to, they play in the same playgrounds. And out of those shared experiences and memories, they develop that strong sense of Singaporean identity. I am a good example of it. Do you, do you feel as though, um, are there tensions pulling at it? For example, you know, uh, people are getting richer and richer in Singapore. Are they trying to opt out of public, public housing more? Not so much. Um, demand for public housing is higher than before. We are not able to build enough flats to meet the demand because of the delays due to COVID, and we are catching up with demand. Uh, so I think the demand for public housing remains. But there are tensions. There, are, there will always be tensions. Um, I think we have also, more importantly in our society, developed an ethos of accommodation and compromise. Accommodation and compromise is not seen as a bad word because in a multi-ethnic society, in a, a society of great diversity, if every group insists on their maximum entitlement and takes every compromise as a slight, as, as, as an insult, to their tribe, I think we will be in for huge trouble. But over the years, we have instead developed an approach of accommodation, compromise, give and take. Not every group gets everything they want, but there is a sense that this is a system that works for all. And that's what we will try to sustain for as long as we can. You also have built a reputation uh, uh, as a great technocracy. You have all these very bright people in government. They get paid well uh, so that there is a less incentive for corruption. Um, and yet the winds of today are all about populism and against a certain kind of elitist technocracy. Do you worry that you, you know, Singapore will have to go down the path of uh, uh, of so many of these countries around the world, and then you, you know, you'll have to spend all this money and uh, you know, engage in populist uh, uh, policies? The, temp the, the pressures will always be there. I mean, we are in a world now where information is widely available, and so everyone thinks that they can be become an expert just by reading on the internet. I mean, when we had COVID in the last three years, everyone was a COVID expert. So the, the pressures are always there, but I think there is still a lot of room for us to develop good, sound policies that work not just you know, for the immediate term, but for the long-term good of Singapore and Singaporeans. I, we are also in an environment where there will be greater contestation of ideas for every new policy and decision, for every decision that is made, it's harder and harder to have policies that, where everyone says, this is a wonderful thing to do. There will be some trade-offs to make, balances to strike, and so for every decision that is made, there will be opposing views, there will be dissenters, there will be criticism. But what's important, certainly for me as a, a leader of the team, is to think about what makes sense, what's right for Singapore and for Singaporeans now and in the long term, and explain, persuade, convince people that this is the right thing to do. And that's what we will continue to do. Now, the PAP, your party, has had a remarkable record of success, electoral success. There are many people who feel that you have unfair advantages. Um, but you have faced some pressures recently. There have been scandals, uh, so, some of it uh, uh, surrounding corruption. Do you think that uh, you will be able to clean up the image of the PAP enough that you will, uh, in the next election, see a return to the kind of uh, near total dominance? We don't have near total dominance. It is, 
political contestation is increasing. Uh, that's to be expected. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, for me, looking at what we must do, uh, particularly after the recent incidents and the setbacks we have suffered, it's really for us to reflect, learn, emerge and, and grow stronger from that experience and do everything we can to win the confidence and trust of Singaporeans. What did, I believe, you, what did you learn from those? Well, I believe we, we start off actually from a very high base. And that high base of trust between the people and the elected government and the PAP is still there. It's still there. So what I, my, my immediate priority is to see how I can strengthen that reservoir of social capital and trust and ensure that we can continue to earn the confidence and mandate of Singaporeans when we next go to the polls. What did you learn from the, from the various scandals and problems? I would say, you know, thinking about not just the recent incidents, but also the broader experience I've had in government, I've learned to have a certain sense of equanimity in government. When things go right, when things go well for us, when people praise us and say we are number one, we are gold standard, don't let that go into our heads. But at the same time, when there are challenges and when there are setbacks, and there are bound to be setbacks, nothing is smooth sailing. There are bound to be mistakes. Like in the last three years when we went through COVID, we had our fair share of setbacks. Or more recently, when we have had these setbacks, then we learn from the setbacks, we learn from the challenges. And in fact, very often, it's the mistakes and the failures. It's in the mistakes and the failures where we find greater motivation to learn and to do better. And that's the attitude I take. When you look at the, the world economy, uh, Singapore has always been able to navigate the world economy very well. What does, when you look at it today, does it look like uh, an attractive picture? We are very worried about the trends. We are worried about how the global multilateral trading system is coming under siege. Uh, there is a change in the global consensus around free trade and win-win economic cooperation. And the logic of interdependence used to prevail. People said you didn't, countries didn't have to be friends to do business with one another. In fact, we promoted interdependence for greater stability. People talked about the McDonald's theory of peace. The Germans talked about change through trade. Now, interdependence has become a bad word. People worry about inter interdependence creating vulnerabilities and that interdependence will become weaponized. Uh, but I think we are at risk of shifting to the other extreme because with countries having fewer stakes in one another's success, I think there will be less inhibitions to act unilaterally. And it may even embolden states to take more aggressive actions. So we really need to think hard about how we continue to strengthen our system of trade, investments, interdependence, while addressing legitimate security concerns that countries may have. So when you look at it, do you think it means the international economy is likely to grow slower with a, with a China that is more inwardly focused, with a US that is more inwardly focused, with a Russia that's essentially out of the economic system? For sure. I think there will be an impact on the global economy. There will be a price to pay for a global economy that is organized not by economic efficiency, but by geopolitics and security considerations and imperatives. For example, America wants to import less from China. They say, well, we want to import fewer cars from China. Let's import from Mexico. But Mexico doesn't have the capability to replace China's manufacturing system. And if Mexico wants to export more cars to America, it will have to very well import more raw materials and intermediate components from China anyway. So from an economic point of view, it doesn't make sense. You say, well, isn't it more efficient to just go direct from China to America? Why go through Mexico? But unfortunately, this is a world where geopolitics prevails.
and there will be a price to pay. It will be greater inefficiency, more cost. Inflation will continue for longer, and that's the world that we are in. What do you think of this uh, fascination with industrial policy, with governments stepping in and funding various industries or technologies? Uh, and it's happening, in, of course, in China. Xi Jinping's Made in China is all about that. But it's now happening in the US. It's happening in the European Union. There, again, the pendulum has shifted. Because I remember a time, again, in the last few decades where we had a global consensus around laissez-faire market systems. In the 90s, Singapore was routinely criticized for having active state involvement in the markets. Now we are a little amused when we looked around and the developed world has started embracing active industrial policies too. But there is a difference. In Singapore, when we talk about state involvement, industrial policies, we are very careful to act in a way that is in line with the market, that reinforces market signals that is compatible with our comparative advantages. And when the government takes actions, we very often focus on infrastructure, public goods, um, and, and doing the right things, rather than having industrial policies that are anti-trade, that put up more barriers to trade and investments, have local content requirements, and in the end, move us in the direction of economic nationalism and protectionism. So we worry about that aspect of industrial policies. So you don't think it's just that you in Singapore do smart industrial policy and others do? There, there, is, a, there is a method to the way you, you, you did it, which was always pro-market rather than, in a sense, fighting against the market to try to revive some old industry that has gone away. I think there is good industrial policy and not so good industrial policies. We have been very careful in how we do industrial policy so that we make good use of public resource. I think if countries en en enter into industrial policies without the same care, it is very possible that governments will end up spending a lot of money on areas that end up being wasteful, inefficient, and do not lead to the outcomes that they hope to achieve. And when you look at the industrial policy being done in the West, do you have those concerns? Uh, we have some of those concerns. I can't, I mean, everyone has different objectives. I think some of the objectives are not just purely economic. Uh, some of them may be security and geopolitical in nature, so they are driven by a different logic. Um, we, we cannot compete with the large developed countries in this subsidies arms race. Germany recently gave out about $10 billion in subsidies for Intel to set up a factory. $10 billion is the entire amount of budget we provide for the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore. So we are not in the same league. And there will be instances where countries and governments are giving out such large subsidies, we'll have to say fine. The companies may well have to go, and we can't have the investments in Singapore. And in a, in a larger sense, does, doesn't it worry you that um, this is a world that is less friendly to small states that are trading states that act as, uh, as, as sort of uh, uh, entrepôts of the global economy? Because increasingly, what seems to matter is do you have a large internal market? Do you have a certain degree of self-sufficiency? Do you have the political weight that comes with that? And Singapore isn't quite in that league. We do worry. That's why I, 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 we do worry that we are in an external environment that is increasingly become less hospitable to small states. Uh, we have long thrived in an environment where there's a rules-based multilateral order, where there are clear rules for trading for countries applicable to countries big and small. It's not always worked perfectly, but I think it has allowed us to thrive and countries to operate in a predictable and stable environment rather than go end up in a situation where might is right and the law of the jungle prevails. Uh, we worry that this is moving in that direction. Uh, and that's why we keep talking about strengthening the WTO. Um, we sound like a broken record. I think we sound sometimes like a lone voice in the wilderness when it comes to the WTO but we think it's an important institution. We have to get the dispute, the uh, settlement body to function properly. We have to get the appellate body to 
worked, and we have to think about how we can strengthen the WTO for this new environment. Do you think that uh, when you look at the rest of the world, the global south, you know, be one way of describing it, um, that they want the same things? In other words, is, is, is part of what the countries in Africa and uh, maybe in Latin America, are, are they looking for rules-based international order, or is this something that is, you know, Singapore and a few other small states are concerned about? It may not be top of mind, but every country wants to see development, growth. Every country, every government wants to see improved incomes and better standards of living for their people. The unfortunate thing is the zeitgeist of our times is such that people think that there are easy answers, that subsidies, that markets don't work anymore. Therefore, state intervention will solve the problem. More subsidies will solve the problem. And I think people who think like that will be sorely disappointed eventually. So the place that I think one could say most believes that, uh, without any question now, is Xi Jinping's China. The made in China, in China policy is all about using the state and the power of the state to direct investment. And um, Do you think that China's current economic problems, which seem fairly significant, are a result of it, of it moving away from a more market-oriented approach toward a more state-oriented approach? I would say that the immediate problems are not so much debt, but very specifically, one around real estate. They have a challenge in the, real, in the property sector. It's a very important part of the economy, but they have a supply overhang problem in real estate, and they've got excess leverage in some very big property companies. So they have to get through that big problem. Uh, there are some also, in addition, sense that demand is quite weak. They have a youth unemployment issue, which they are addressing. Uh, but demand so far has been weak, and in particular, domestic demand has been weak. Not to mention that because of all the measures that the West and America has imposed on them, their exports and their trade has also come down. FDIs have also been impacted. So they have to find some way to stimulate demand. The government, I'm sure, is aware of this. They are, they are very competent technocrats in government. They know what to do. But uh, to, to get consumption going again requires not just short-term measures. It also requires longer-term structural solutions to strengthen their social safety net. And in a large country like China, to start thinking about putting in place stronger social security and healthcare systems, that is quite a complex undertaking. But they are thinking very hard about these issues. As you said, though, the core of the problem in China, outside of the specifics of real estate, is a lack of demand. There is, there is people are just not spending as much, um, and they're saving a lot. And it does seem this is in some ways related to uh, the fact that the government has been very tough on the private sector over the last five or six years, on the tech sector, on online education, on real estate. So do you, is there a way you think that the, 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 can she change his course and will the public be convinced or you know, is it, is it Adam Posen, the former deputy uh, governor of the, of the uh, British Central Bank, says, once you scare people like that, it becomes very hard to regain their confidence and say, no, you know, it's fine, invest in the system, it's all going to be market-oriented. I, I read, I, I, I know Adam Posen, I've seen his comments, but I think at the end of the day, if you look at, you know, just do a survey of, of what, uh, the Chinese businesses, Chinese residents, ch what people in China think, there is a great determination to move forward. I don't think they see the immediate challenges as something that will hold them back. Uh, they do, they, there, are, there are concerns that the measures that have been imposed by the US and the West will slow down China in terms of accessing cutting edge technologies but it's not going to keep China down because they are determined to move forward. They see this as China's time in the world. 
and China wants to take its rightful place in the world as a modern great nation. And, and so there is tremendous drive and determination, not just at the government leadership level, but amongst the private businesses, entrepreneurs, businesses to move forward. I read a blog recently by a Chinese uh, tech, tech influencer. They wrote a blog in Mandarin. He says, in the first industrial revolution, you had steam engines. China was in isolation. In the second industrial revolution with electricity, you had the tumultuous Qing dynasty. In the third industrial revolution with computers, well, China managed to catch up some, but not completely. Now, we are in the fourth industrial revolution with digitalization and AI. We will not be left behind. And this is not from a government, not from a party person. This is just from an ordinary tech person in China. But it shows you the determination of the people to want to get ahead. But if one were to play devil's advocate, the, that determination probably was there in, I don't know, in India in the 1950s, in Japan in the 1980s. Yes. My question to you is, Xi Jinping's vision of how China will prosper in that fourth industrial revolution is very much that the government will lead the process economically. Is that the right approach? I think they will have to find a balance in China. They understand that business and enterprise cannot ultimately be led by government. What does government know about doing business? You need a healthy, vibrant private enterprise sector for the economy to work, and they will have to find the right balance for themselves. But you don't think China is the next Japan? 20 years of, of low growth? I don't think so. Not, not, not right now, because yes, there, is, there are signs of low, you know, prices coming down, uh, property market, saving, people are saving more, not spending. But I think the officials understand fully what needs to be done, and there are competent technocrats that will be able to come up with solutions to tackle the current economic challenges that China faces. When you look at it geopolitically, um, under Xi Jinping, China has been much more aggressive, uh, particularly uh, with its neighbors. So the policies toward Australia, for example, the so-called 14 demands where the Chinese government essentially asked the Australian uh, government to stop doing certain things, including to have its think tanks and its newspapers not print anti-Chinese things, um, the clash in the borders with India, some of the claims with Vietnam and the Philippines and the South China Seas. Um, do you think that, uh, wh what do you think explains that? And do you think uh, that, we, that there has been a course correction there? The Chinese talk about three phases in their journey. They want to stand up, get rich, get strong. I think they are in the get strong phase of their journey. And when you are a strong country, you want to assert your interest. Whether it's claims in the South China Sea that you feel it's yours, whether it's interests that you feel you know, are infringed upon by another state, then you assert your interest. And that's what China has been doing. But in the course of doing so, I think they also understand that there will be a reaction from other countries, and again there, they will have to find their balance in going about this. Do you think that they have, they, they have looked at, do you think they, they got more pushback than they expected? They certainly got a strong pushback from the US, and, and so what America has done now is going to be the big issue in the world. This, new relationship, uh, the, the new defining feature of US-China relationship is no longer one of engagement, but one of strategic competition. People say it's full spectrum strategic competition, but it's really extreme competition. And what we worry about is what can go wrong in this dynamic, because one country does something, the other country can retaliate, and you create a tit-for-tat dynamic that can result in huge costs for both America and China and a lot of trouble for the rest of us in the world. So you don't feel that there is a kind of 
uh, equilibrium that has been reached right now. We are certainly not in equilibrium. I think we, the, the world has to start thinking hard about, you see, if you take a military sort of parallel, in, in the security world, uh, we think very hard about the collateral damage that's associated with dropping a bomb. People, you know, you understand the damage that you will inflict with using a weapon, but you, analysts, you know, the security community thinks very hard about retaliation, the risk of escalation, and then you consider carefully the consequences before you make any decision. Now, we are seeing full spectrum competition across economic and financial arenas. But I don't think the world has a lot of experience using these sorts of economic and financial tools. And we, it's not so straightforward to assess the collateral damage that will be inflicted with the use of these tools. And, and we, we really should think very hard about how the dynamic that's now being created because of the US-China extreme competition can lead us down a path that will be disastrous for the global economy. Who's to blame, the US or China? I should not comment on that. <laughs> we want to be friends with both America and China for a very long time. Um, let, let me ask it another way, though. Um, do, you think that, do you think that this competition can exist in the economic and technological spheres without spilling over as much into the security sphere? Because the, the Biden administration certainly keeps saying, look, we don't want conflict. What we are looking for is a small garden with a small yard with high I walls think. of these core technologies that we believe if we were to give to China, they will use it for their military. And so outside of that, so for example, with chips, 95% of chips, it's an open global market. It's just the top 5% that we are reserving. Is that model workable? Well, let me put it to you like this. My understanding from talking to experts in this field is that there is no single chip which you can say, if you don't have this chip, then all your modernization efforts, your military modernization efforts will grind to a halt. There is no single chip like that because there are always workaround solutions. Exactly. With the 95% of chips, you can find workaround solutions. There will be a trade-off, trade-off in terms of performance, in terms of power consumption, in terms of reliability, but you can design a workaround solution. So this idea that having 5% of chips denying access will keep China down, I think is, yes, it will slow down China's access to high-end capabilities to some extent, but it's not going to keep China down forever. China will still be around, and America has to learn to live with China and coexist with China. And hopefully the two countries will be able to find ways to manage their differences and live together. So the biggest flashpoint, of course, is Taiwan. Do you think things have gotten more dangerous uh, with regard to Taiwan in the last few months? For sure, they have. All sides claim to uphold the status quo, but tensions are high and continuing to rise. It does not help that I think some parties portray Taiwan as an issue of ideological contest between democracy and autocracy, or that some, you know, there are people who draw a parallel with Ukraine, and you've got media headlines saying Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. I think these are very dangerous and these are alarming. So what we hope is that, I mean, there, there are no easy answers for Taiwan, but what we hope is that all parties will exercise restraint and maintain the status quo. And if there were to be any change, if the, uh, any such change has to happen in a way that's peaceful and non-forcible, it will take a long time for this to happen, 
And that's why it's important to continue engagement, to continue diplomacy. Diplomacy, as we are always reminded, does not operate in a linear fashion. It's not a straight line. It curves and bends. And, and, but we have to talk. If there are issues which are irreconcilable, sometimes the wiser thing to do is not to force a resolution immediately, but to set these issues aside and focus on the issues of common interest. And hopefully, US and China can do so. When you look at the Taiwan situation, do you think that Xi Jinping, as many people say, is determined to, to as one of part of his achievements, of, of his accomplishments, uh, to, to achieve a forcible reunification of Taiwan in the next five, ten years? I don't think that's their basic expectation at all. Uh, not a forcible reunification. Taiwan is to China a very important matter because it is to China the redest of red lines. It is about sovereignty. You can talk about economics with China, you can talk about trade, you can talk about chips, you can talk about intellectual property, but one China, that's non-negotiable because it's a matter of sovereignty. And I'm sure this applies to many other countries, but neither is it their objective to reunify Taiwan through forcible means. No, certainly not in the way that has been portrayed in the media. But it's fair to say that that's probably the only way they could reunify it in. I mean, right now, it does not appear that Taiwan is clamoring to become part of, of mainland China. Yes, indeed so. Sentiments have shifted compared to, say, 1972 when Kissinger visited. And there was an understanding that on both sides of the straits, people accept and recognize one China. Uh, sentiments today in Taiwan are very different from 1972. But who knows what the sentiments will be 30, 40 years from now. So you say just kick the can down the road because it, it's easier than confronting it. Well, kick the can down the road sounds like a bad thing to do. Uh, sounds like people are not taking responsibility. But what is the alternative? Is the alternative to force a resolution that can lead to conflict and confrontation, I don't think that's any wiser, no better. But we should engage, we should talk. Um, and, and, and even in the recent time, I, I've noticed that sentiments in Taiwan have shifted after Ukraine. Yeah. Um, there, there, there is a greater desire for stability. You know, it's not shifted towards one China, but there is certainly a greater understanding and concern amongst the Taiwanese population about unilateral moves towards independence and what consequences that may bring to Taiwan and to the safety and security of Taiwan. And that's reflected in many of the polls. If uh, China were to blockade Taiwan or engage in some kind of military intervention in Taiwan, what would Singapore's position be? You have military relations with, with Taiwan. You do some of your training exercises there. We do. Uh, I mean, it really depends. There are many hypothetical situations that can arise. So rather than speculate on all of these hypothetical situations, we are very clear. We uphold a one China policy. It's not just us, incidentally. US, all the ASEAN countries, Many, many countries around the world have some version of a one-China policy. So really, what triggers a blockade, what triggers prov provocation or escalation really depends on the context, but we are very clear about our policy on one China. Let me ask you about uh, the other big global crisis that you've mentioned a couple of times. When you look at the, the problem with uh, Russia and Ukraine, Singapore has been very uh, 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 forward-leaning uh, in, in, in condemning that, in supporting the sanctions against Russia. Where do you think this goes? It's hard to tell. I, I mean, we, we are not monitoring this as closely because it's not within our region. But um, it looks like it's going to be a long haul before we can see any resolution. And, and that means the world will be fragmented with Russia isolated for a long time? I, I, unfortunately, I think that's the very likely 
scenario that we have to work on. And does, does that mean to you that adds to these pressures of a fragmented global, global economy? It does. Um, we, we are concerned that it's, as I mentioned just now, you know, we are in, going to be in a world with more frictions on global flows. We are going to be in a world where there will be greater fragmentation. It's not going to be as conducive for small open economies like us. But at the same time, I think there are silver linings even in the darkest of clouds. And we are starting off in Singapore now in a much better position than we did, say, in the 60s or 70s when we first became independent. We have more resources. We are better equipped to deal with our vulnerabilities. We have a better system in place to adapt and to adjust and to develop effective long-term policies. And we have a solid reputation as a reliable and trusted hub for the region and for the world. So we can build on all of these advantages, invest in our competitive strengths, continue to attract capital, talent, and flows into Singapore, and ensure we uh, keep on raising the standards of living for our people. You have a very strong security relationship with the United States, and you do a massive amount of economic business with China. If those countries were to tell you that Singapore has to choose between America and China, what would you say? If it ever were to come to that, it's not just Singapore that's going to be affected. It's the whole world. And we better buckle our seatbelts if, if, if it were to come to that. Because, you know, this is not like in the Cold War where you had the Soviet Union and you have two systems, you can operate two systems. China's sheer size and scale today is much larger than the Soviet Union was and it's embedded deeply in the global economy today. If countries, not just Singapore, countries everywhere have to say, look, I either choose a Chinese system or a US system for everything, not just for high tech, but for everything, I think it will be disastrous for all of us. So you're hoping you won't have to make that choice? I'm hoping for the good of the world that we don't have to make that choice. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, that's fascinating. Now, um, let's move to the uh, audience uh, part of this. Uh, I, my only request is if you ask a question, that it be in fact a question, and that you identify yourself, your name and your organization, uh, if there is one. Um, and if I can get a show of hands, yeah, I see somebody in the back there. I think it, somebody's going to try and get a mic to you uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we have one there to start. Yep. Your, Ex Your Excellency, Deputy PM, esteemed moderator, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tsawong Nidup from Bhutan, currently pursuing Masters in Public Policy at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Trust is the unique selling point of Singapore, known worldwide. I believe in Zig Zagler's words, one of the most prolific motivational speakers, who says, if people like you, they will listen to you. If people trust you, they will do business with you. And your question is? And to put the lens in the right frame, going forward, how do you ensure Singapore remains at the center of trust at the intersection of rising Gen Z, uh, rising technological disruption, geopolitical uh, tensions, and economic disruptions? How, first, how to maintain, second, maintain trust? Let's do, one, let's do one question at a time. Sir, can we, we'll collect a few so that sure. the Thank Deputy you. Prime Minister can get at the back there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is Moshe Tassib. I work for Channel 24. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm one of the AJF fellows this year. Um, uh, Deputy Prime Minister on this side. So I hope you're well aware of uh, the fact uh, the Rohingya issue, which is quite disturbing for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is hosting around 1.2 million Rohingyas. Uh, now, we won't see the, there is a stable situation in Myanmar. In this case, I would love to know your position, how uh, you can expand your hands to help Bangladesh and maybe take some role being a leader 
in the Asia to normalize the situation in Myanmar. Important question. Let's take one more on this side. Um, sorry, there. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, DPM. I'm Kagan from Tomasic Polytechnic. As we transition into an era of strategic competition, or possibly an extreme competition with all its challenges, what mental framework should new leaders adopt when contributing towards Singapore's social and economic growth and in building an accountable and trusted system of governance? Thank you. Okay. Thank I want you. To take those here. Yeah. So how I, th I think the first and the third questions are in some ways related because it's about building trust and sustaining trust. How do we do that? At one level for Singapore, it's really to be consistent, principled and credible in how we act internationally. So we have always said that we don't choose sides. We are not siding with one country or another. It's not US or China. We choose principles. What kind of principles? We uphold international law. We uphold a rules-based multilateral order. We stand for the key principle of territorial integrity and sovereignty, and the freedom of being attacked by another country as enshrined in the United Nations Charter. And, and we have acted consistently in line with these principles. So when the US attacked Grenada in the early 80s, we voted against the attack against the US in the United Nations. And likewise now, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have voted against it and acted, taken actions against this. So it's, it's how Singapore operates. We are consistent, we are principled, we are credible in our actions. People, friends, other countries know what Singapore stands for. You may not all, always agree with us, but you know that this is Singapore and we hope through our consistent and predictable actions, we make for a more reliable and trusted partner. So that's on the international scene. Within Singapore itself, I think trust is built when we are able to make sure that every citizen, you know, regardless of backgrounds, benefits from the nation's success. No one is left behind. People feel a stake and have a stake in Singapore's success and feel that they are part of shaping the country's future. And that's what we've consistently been trying to do throughout our nation-building journey. And going forward, as we see more turbulence, more disruptions, more volatility, uh, we are reviewing our policies now to see how we can strengthen the assurances for Singaporeans. That's why we are embarking on an exercise we've called uh, Forward Singapore to, to refresh, update our social compact and to see what changes in social policies would be needed to provide that assurance to Singaporeans. For example, I think with technological disruptions uh, you know, and, and the rapid changes that are taking place, there will be certainly more churn in the workplace. It doesn't mean there will be not, it doesn't mean we won't have enough jobs created. I'm sure we will be able to create jobs. I'm sure there will be new jobs. There will be demand for workers, but the individual will experience more churn, more disruptions in, in, at work, more transitions through different careers. And so one of the things we are looking at as part of this Forward Singapore exercise is to see how we can strengthen our system of continuing education and training. Beyond formal schooling, what more can we do for the system we call Skills Future, where we can provide better training, reskilling, upskilling of individuals, so that regardless of the disruptions that happen to an individual's careers or whatever happens at the workplace, you know, people will have some sense of assurance that they can get training, get reskilled, and then find another job, hopefully a better job, and they can get a second or even a third win in their careers. So this is just an illustration of how we will continually review, update our policies to make sure that we maintain a high level of trust in our society. On the third question on Myanmar, it is a very important issue, but there are no easy answers, unfortunately. Uh, no external party can come in to dictate or, or, or tell the government in Myanmar what to do. In the end, they have to resolve it themselves. ASEAN has put out a plan or five-point consensus. Um, it will take time. It had happened in, uh, earlier, 
where with the nudging, the persuasion, the influence of all the different parties, including ASEAN, eventually the Myanmar government found a way or the, the, the military in Myanmar found a way to move forward. This was previously, I think, around 2006, 2007. Uh, we'll have to see whether it works this time, but we have to be prepared that it will take time and ultimately it will be the people in Myanmar itself who will have to resolve this very difficult issue. Let's take one from here. Hi, my name is Angie Chu. Um, it's very heartening that uh, there's a high code of conduct and uh, politicians are being asked to resign or they step down when there is a scandal like extramarital affair. When will this be also transposed to the civil service? As uh, you know, we all respect the civil service. It has a high integrity at the moment, but it doesn't mean the extramarital affairs are not happening. So when is a HR policy going to be put in place so that you don't have a scandal like a perm sec having an affair with one of the juniors? Shall we take one over here? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, DPM. Uh, I'm Judy, a student representative of Raffles Institution. So my question is with regards to Singapore's economic stance in trade. So in global, global winds of change in the context of COVID, we see the trading bloc economies ushering into a protectionist era with advanced economies rolling out subsidies, as you have mentioned earlier. So as a small state in a multilateral system, do we see Singapore following this trend to stay competitive and using selective policies in order to protect the interests of the people, or at least adopting a different pattern of globalization, and what would this change be? Thank you. And let me add a third one to this, uh, if I may, uh, DPM, which is from the, uh, the iPad, meaning the online audience. Uh, Ong Ching Men asks, with everyone keeping their original identities, what are the challenges in layering on the Singapore identity? How much immigration can we take without diluting this identity? Thank you. Three very different questions. Um, on the civil service and code of conduct, first of all, where the government is concerned, where ministers are concerned, and the, where the PAP is concerned and the rules of prudence, the Prime Minister has laid out the principles very clearly in Parliament. But I, I don't want to belabor or go through the points in great detail, but as, as he explained, where it comes to corruption and criminal wrongdoing, we have zero tolerance. It, we are very clear about that. Where it comes to personal, personal behaviours, moral issues, it's much more complex, and you really have to look at it case by case. And he lay, hi, highlighted and explained three different scenarios. One, where indeed there could be an extramarital affair, something that a personal conduct that fell short of standards, but the person is counselled, the person is spoken to, and he rectifies his actions and then life, life continues. A second scenario would be one quite ex on the other extreme where there's improper relationship, particularly when there is a superior and subordinate relationship that's not quite right, and then indeed actions have to be taken. And of course, you have a third scenario which could be something in between. And so th that's the basis in which the PAP and uh, operates when it comes to issues of morality and personal conduct. The civil service has its own code, and I would say it's not very different from the principles which I have just laid out. Uh, but meaning to say there is a very clear difference between issues of corruption, criminal wrongdoing for which we have zero tolerance, and issues of personal conduct, and it will really depend on the specific uh, details of the case and whether it's the government, whether it's a PAP or whether it's a civil service, we will want to do the right thing but at the same time exercise compassion and sensitivity to innocent parties, especially to family members, spouses and children. Um, on Judy's question, I think about selective, about what Singapore will do in response to this new environment where there will be more state subsidies, more active industrial policies. Uh, will we match? Well, I've, as I've described, we can't possibly match the scale of subsidies that are being thrown out by many other developed countries. So in some instances, we will have to say, too bad if governments are giving out so much money just to anchor that particular investment. Uh, 
it doesn't make sense for Singapore to be part of this subsidies arms race. But to be clear, we are not standing still, we are not doing nothing. We are continuing to invest in our capabilities, to invest in new areas of growth. We are continuing to attract investments into Singapore, and we have every confidence that Singapore can continue to do well, and we can cre create many more good jobs for Singaporeans. As I mentioned just now, our reputation is good, particularly going through COVID. We are a reliable and trusted hub. We are investing in expanding our airports and our seaports. And so in areas like finance, advanced manufacturing, logistics, green economy, I think these are all new areas where there will be continued growth and opportunities for Singaporeans young and old. On identity, uh, yes, there is a limit to how much we can bring in. And that's why we have been controlling the numbers. It's not limitless, it's not uh, excessive. We have been regulating the numbers because at the end of the day, the numbers are constrained by how much we are able to integrate the new arrivals. We welcome them. We must stay open as a society. That's not just essential for Singapore, it's existential for us. Because at, you know, given our current birth rates, which is something like just above 1.0, you know, if we are not able to bring in immigrants to top up the population, then we are in a structural decline. And eventually, the population will decline, the workforce will decline, and Singapore will decline. So we have to continue taking in immigrants, welcome them, those who embrace our values and our way of life, we should integrate them into our society. But the pace at which we are able to bring in immigrants will, in the end, depend on how well we are able to integrate them. And that takes both sides. It takes the new arrivals to adjust and to embrace our values and way of life, but it also takes us in Singapore to be open-minded, to embrace them and welcome them as part of the family. Let's take one quick one here. I think we have, okay, we'll take, take one there. Um, do, do, is that the young man? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm, Uj I'm Ujia from Raffles Institution. Thank you to both sirs for gracing this event. So my question is about Singapore's domestic policy. Sorry in, in advance for my long preamble, but COVID-19 and the dormitory situation has unfortunately revealed that migrant workers are still being marginalised and more still has to be done to integrate them. Now, I feel that the problem is an institutional one where the current work permit system impedes the ability of migrant workers to connect with the local population and laws like those that prohibit them from bringing their dependents or prohibiting them from applying for citizenship stress the idea that these workers are just transient, that they are just there for work and work alone. So cognizant of this and cognizant that we plan to have a greater proportion of these workers in our workforce, do you think that we should move away from this solely utilitarian view of foreign workers and if a change in our current institution or system is warranted? Thank you. Very intelligently phrased. Why don't you uh, take oh, that? Uh, sure. VPN? We do want to embrace uh, our work permit holders and they are a very vital part of our economy. We saw that during the COVID period where they make so many sacrifices and we saw how much, of, you know, how, how much they contribute to building Singapore, the, our residential apartments, our ports, so many different aspects. So we do owe it to our migrant workers, particularly the work permit holders, to make sure that they can work safely here to make sure that they have a good environment in Singapore. And we are continuing to improve our standards. So we talk about dormitory standards. We have just updated those dormitory standards to make sure that we give them a better living environment. And we will continue to look at different ways to take care of these migrant workers, including their mental well-being, spaces for recreation, whole range of issues that government agencies are in fact very focused on. 
And if you look around the world at countries with large proportions of migrant workers, in fact, I think we can hold, you know, we can in good conscience say that in Singapore we treat our migrant workers well and we will continue to do better. Now, you say there are structural impediments in terms of some of them becoming, uh, you know, being able to bring in dependents and eventually coming in to, um, you know, take on permanent residency and that, that sort of thing. Yes, there will be challenges in if all of them suddenly overnight become permanent residents or bring their dependents. We just, going back to the earlier question, we will not have the ability to integrate all of them into our society. So one has to understand the balance. We have for migrant workers in our midst, we welcome them. Amongst the whole spread of migrant of workers from work permit to employment passes, a small proportion will come in as permanent residents. And it's gated, it's regulated, and we want to make sure that those who come in as permanent residents and eventually citizens are the ones who have the best chance to integrate into our society and embrace our way of life. That must be the approach. So that gating, that regulated flow will always be there. But it doesn't mean that we treat the rest of the migrant workers badly. On the contrary, we will do everything we can from a government point of view to improve their work conditions and their living conditions. And we also appeal to Singaporeans to do their part. And that's why if I were to build a dormitory next to your home, please welcome that dormitory with open arms. <laughs> All right. Um, let me ask a final question, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, which I have a personal interest in because it involves a dear friend of mine. Who is your pick for the upcoming presidential election? I shall keep my pick to myself, but I would encourage everyone in Singapore to consider very carefully and choose the best candidate who can hold the highest office of the land. <laughs> All right, with that, with that diplomatic answer, Mr. pleasure to see you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.